For example, you may have noticed that in playing a scale this way, that, this, that the actual sound of the scale is ascending and the hand is descending in a way. This way it's ascending, which is an agreement, but this way is, is the hand descends, the scale ascends. Another value in playing on all, uh, one scale on four strings is you'll notice is that then this becomes a way of playing for example, and all uh, uh, a scale, for example, in B major, all, have, all that happens is the hand shifts. This way. If one pays attention to what notes are being sounded, one begins to develop, I think, a better understanding of the, of the fingerboard. Of where the, where the pitches are, also what happens with the shoulders, with the back, with the feet when one does that. Uh, again, these are all, we're looking at the physical manipulation of the hand and some of the value in that of the, uh, the, in, the, the value of intonation and also just the hearing of tones. This is very, me very uh, mechanical kind of work. It's, it's like, uh, uh, doesn't sound too musical, doesn't have any uh, significance to begin with, like, like a, an impatience to get to the good stuff. My experience is that I've probably developed more facility from paying attention to very simple things like the, sh the physical aspect and listening very closely to what I'm playing. Probably more value from that than from, the, from trying to be theoretical about anything. Um, the way of developing this hand, then we've been going across a bit using the same approach if one wanted to play an arpeggio, or wanted to play up and down the fingerboard. Uh, again, if we took something like the same, pro the, the same sequence again is involved. For example, first of all, the physicalness of it. Now listening, not, not just the physical, but now listening to what sounds that is, the intonation of it. Now one thing that's noticed is that, and the, a common problem that arises in going from the lower part to the top part of the instrument is this. In other words, the body begins to move forward, the head moves forward, rather than having it be back this way. Now, this doesn't necessarily always create a problem. However, if the head is too far over this way long enough, you're going to feel it in your back, and it usually eventually creates some kind of a problem. So again, this way is to leave, basically is, uh, an attempting to leave the body as, let the body as, be relaxed as possible. And notice when you're doing this, uh, what may be going on physically with you if you're out of tune, and do you flinch? And just paying attention to that, not necessarily trying to do anything about it, but noticing it. Again, with the, 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 the paying attention to all this, the pressure of the fingers and the movement of the arm. If the bass is set up in such a way, whether you're standing or sitting, such that when you put your hand over the strings, you're pretty much covering at least three quarters of the fingerboard, then it obviates having to move the head around. That's to say you don't have to move the head around. Again, going back to the physical now for a moment. If I played a sequence like, and then you ask yourself to play this instead of at this tempo, twice as fast, 
and begin to notice what happens with the hand or play it twice as loud. One of the common errors that's not errors, but one of the common things that happens if you're like me is when you first start doing this exercise, no problem in playing it mezzo forte. But if to be twice as loud, you start pulling twice as hard, but this hand starts to squeeze twice as hard, which is absolutely reductive. It it's, uh, doesn't work. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't subtract anything, except energy. So in one exercise, then, is taking going back to this physical and playing it in, in different volume levels. If you play it. Notice what happens to this finger or the arm weight. You'll find it to a point where no matter how loud you can, how hard you can pull, there's, there is a threshold where beyond that point it doesn't do any good to, to squeeze. Um, so again, then practicing a line or a, a fragment of scale or whatever. If it's done. Uh, pianissimo or triple forte. This hand will be pulling harder than this hand will be pressing. The second part that I found, a second aspect or, or area in working with this, and there's a question that's been asked me many times, is ear development. Since it's not a harmonic instrument, how can we use the instrument to develop our ears? Again, first of all, recognizing a particular interval, let's say. Let's take an A and an F. Now this particular interval can be produced by the first finger, let's say, and the second finger harmonically or melodically, either this way or this way. Paying attention to the pressure and what's happening to the distribution of, of uh, energy or stress on the fingers, arm weight again, also what's going on throughout your whole body. Listening to, from a, a basically mental level and, and understanding, hearing these sounds, knowing that, if, for example, this particular interval is a major third. But from an intuitive standpoint, this major third may not be a major third. And we'll get to that. But noticing what am I hearing beyond just the major third? What is it that I'm hearing here? And continue to listen to it. Is it something as simple as... Or is it... Just what am I hearing here? To understand what that really means is that we will notice that we'll tend to hear, for example, this major third. There will be a strong tendency to hear this major third in the absence of anything that preceded it or that follows it as a mi do or a three to a one. Or we may hear it as a seven down to a five or T so. Or another possibility is to hear it as a la fa in the key of C. One thing that can be done with the instrument to develop that facility in ear training is to play this interval, recognizing it as a major third, and then ask yourself, which one are you hearing? Are you hearing a la to a fa? If not, what are you hearing? Well, I'm hearing a me to a do. Fine. Now, play the same interval and hear this or intuit this interval as La down to Fa instead of Mi down to Do. Mm -hmm. 
hear it as T down to so, and then complete it. So three steps in demonstrating this particular interval. One is playing the interval and hearing that. The next is intuiting what that tonal relationship is. The third step is confirmation. In other words, melodically confirm that indeed this is T down to so, or me down to do or la down to fa. La down to fa. Me down to do. T down to so. Now, we'll also note that in a major scale, then there are four, there are three major thirds. If we took C, we would have me E down to C, which is a major third, A down to F, which is a major third, and B down to G, which is a major third. So three major thirds in the key of C major. As a pitch interval, they are all identical, simply because the frequency ratio of the top over the bottom is identical in each case. So they're the same interval pitch-wise. Tonally, of course, they're completely different. Uh, me down to do is not la down to fa, it's not t down to so. And because of that, we can look through the scale and we can also find that there are four minor thirds, six perfect fourths, one tritone, five major seconds, and then plus their inversions. So it comes up with like 42 intervals, and each one of those intervals can be approached in the same way. First of all, playing the interval, identifying it as a major third, a minor third, uh, perfect fourth, whatever, intuiting what the which particular one it is, and then confirming it melodically. One example for this in, with respect to perfect fourths, for example, is the beginning of All the Things You Are Now that opening interval of a perfect fourth, if sounded just by itself and I didn't mention all the things you are, there would be a very strong tendency to hear that as a so do. But in fact, this one is do up to fa. With the harmony becomes even clearer. Another tune that begins essentially with the same pitch relationship but a completely different tonal relationship is I'll see you again, a me up to a la. So one, again, we could, if you, we could go through the whole scale, there's 42, just in a major scale, 42 tonally unique intervals, which we won't do now, but then there are the chromatic intervals as well. And one, to develop their ear, just in hearing a tonal interval, you can simply invent different possibilities following this kind of like three-step process where you play a given pitch or play a given interval, identify that interval as to what its class is, major, minor, second, seventh, whatever, intuiting what its tonal relationship is, and then uh, playing something that affirms that tonal relationship. An example that is really quite uh, startling in a way was for me is the difference between now not just a particular pitch interval but what's referred to as its enharmonic equivalent. 